دون تأخير جلستنا المقبلة بعنوان الأساس الاقتصادي لإنشاء مدن تنافسية سيدير هذه الجلسة السيد إد بويزمان رئيس العقارات في أوروبا والشرق الأوسط والهند وأفريقيا في إرنست ويونغ وسيتحدث فيها معالي السيد أردوغان البرقدار وزير البيئة والتحضر في جمهورية تركيا والسيد جوزيف دانكو العضو المنتدب للبرامج الحضارية في سي اتش تو ام هيل الولايات المتحدة الأمريكية والدكتور ليو تايكير مدير المخططين المعماريين والمهندسين في شركة ار اس بي في سنغافورة أرجو من السادة المشاركين في هذه الجلسة الحضور إلى المسرح Excellencies Ladies and Gentlemen I believe this was a great discussion and we'd like to add another one on competitive cities. Cities are important as they always have. The urban investment network even calls cities a solution to the global crisis. At their worst, cities are slums with lots of social unrest, obsolete on non-existing infrastructure and social housing, air pollution, congested roads, and poor and unemployed people living in utterly isolation. At the best though, there are livable green places, attracting students and young and talented people. They attract international businesses have high quality transport and housing for all and where innovation happens and wealth is being created. Urbanization is continuing. It is estimated that almost 70% of our population will live in urban areas by 2050. Investors in real estate and multinationals searching for global and regional headquarters, more and more tend to look at cities rather than at countries. And they favor cities with growth ambitious. So be ambitious. Big metros like New York, London and Tokyo, each had more than 20 billion US dollar invested over the last six months of 2012. And in fact, the 10 largest cities had more than 200 US dollar billion invested over that same period. That is 50% of all global investment in real estate. Isn't that an astonishing figure? Doesn't that underline how important cities really are? And how about new cities? China and India only will build hundreds of new cities in the next decades. And what's typical is that these cities are more and more based on private developments rather than on the structure of cooperation between government and the private sector as embedded in the Western model. Integrated design, planning and construction of an entire new city is a completely new product for developers. But cities need to be open for business, but the private and the public sector also have different roles. It is player versus referee. So it is a model where the private sector takes the lead in developing new cities, is that a sustainable model? On another topic, cities still often create and manage their infrastructure themselves. And many cities are not able to successfully collaborate in public-private partnerships. We see that everywhere, not only in emerging countries, in developing countries, but the same goes for Western Europe, for the United States. Innovation is too often far to seek. On the other hand, cities are increasingly behaving like companies 
and they must do. They spend a lot of money and a lot of time on city branding. And they are competing for customers, just like companies do. But to be competitive, cities will need to back up their global ambitions with home improvement. Improvements that will enhance their domestic, economic environment and also their infrastructure. And these range from upgrading major transport links like ports, airports and rail links, but also investments in high-speed broadband infrastructure. It is a connected world and cities need to be connected as well. Competing cities are also seeking investments in diverse forms and from many sources. And they need to commit themselves to be in business and investor friendly. According to The Economist, a major magazine, US and European cities are the world's most competitive today and why they attract capital, businesses, talent and tourists. Among others, as they are able to attract their talents, but also because they have cultural activities to offer and a good quality of life. So it's not just economics, it's also quality of life, livable cities. Housing, whether social or other housing, a key theme at this conference and cover tomorrow also contributes to both the economic growth of cities, but if ill-managed, it also can lead to contraction. So I talked about competition, about competitive cities, but how do cities compete? How can they distinct themselves and how do they attract that capital, whether economic or human, innovation and talent? And also, can newly built cities compete better than existing cities or is it exactly the other way around? Which cities are doing well, which not, and why is that the case? These are some of the issues we will discuss today with our distinguished panel. So let me introduce the panel members to you. And I go from the right for you to the left. Let me start with Dr. Tai Ker Liu, Director of RSP Architects Planning and Engineer from Singapore. A warm welcome to you. Secondly, we have Joseph or Joe Denko, Managing Director of Urban Programs of a company called CH2M Hill, one of the largest developers in the world. Joe is from the USA. Joe? And finally, we have David Smith. You will see him a lot of times today and tomorrow on the panel. David is from Boston and is, he is the founder of the Affordable Housing Institute. And in fact, David is co-author of a beautiful report, The Growing Crisis of Affordable Housing in MENA, an Ernst Young production, allow me to say that. David? So, before we kick off with Q&As, I would like to ask each of our distinguished panelists to give, its own, to give their own introduction to the subject based on their own experience. Mr. Taikar, can I start with you? Would you like to be seated here or here? That one, yeah. Can you hear me? Okay, uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen, excellencies, and your highness. The, um, I thought I will uh, make a short presentation about, uh, from, from a perspective of a physical planner, 
and with my experience in Singapore, because since I arrived uh, yesterday and listening to uh, various people, including this morning's session, I thought I would just uh, share with you the Singapore experience in public housing as well as Singapore experience in city planning. So let me start. Um, in public housing, just want to say that in 1960, when we became uh, independent from the British government, we had 1.9 million people in total. And uh, out of this, 1.3 million live in squatter colonies, 1.3 million. And, uh, but today, we have 5.3 million people. And 82% of the people live in public housing. And of all the citizens in Singapore, about 93% own their own homes. And also, also in, because the Housing Development Board does a five yearly survey on how happy the residents are in public housing. And for the last 20 years, the satisfaction rate has been 95%. So this is the kind of uh, track record that we have. And actually, how do we do, do that? We, uh, so far, we've created 23 new towns. Each new town would have around 200,000 people because in our research, we know that if we don't have 200,000 people, it's difficult for people who live in the new town to be, self uh, to be largely self-sufficient. That means if you have 200,000 people per new town, you can actually satisfy most of your daily needs in the area, in the area of, of th 13 to 15 square kilometer. And of course, if you're very fussy, if you want to buy and take, you buy a very expensive jewelry, you cannot do it in a new town. You have to go out to the city center. So the emphasis is it's a new town as a basic building block. And we try to make the, uh, the new town very self-sufficient. And uh, so to make it self-sufficient, in each new town, we use up less than 50%, it's like 45% of the land for housing, 45%. The rest would be for roads, parks, sports uh, facilities, clinics, shops, schools, polytechnic, <coughs> and so on. And that's what I mean, that you, know, you can live a new town and actually not feeling, uh, not having to go out of the city uh, out of town too much. In fact, we also have clean industries inside the new towns. So, and a lot of this clean industry attract female workers. And female workers, they can work in the new town, in the clean industries, and go home at lunch or go home early in the evening to look after their children. So this is the kind of uh, thinking that we have when we uh, plan a new town. So uh, as a result of that, in, uh, I would say that by bet between 1960 and 1985, we try our best to house the squatters <coughs> in, into the housing estate. So by around 1985, it's quite safe for me to say that Singapore as a city has achieved this, that is, we, we don't have homeless people. Everybody has a home by 1985. We don't have squatters. They all disappeared. Well, with a little bit, maybe one or two percent, we're still cleaning up. And therefore, young Singaporeans who were born after 1985 don't even know we had squatters. That's the second point. No homeless, no squatters, no ghettos. Because through public housing uh, implementation, we were very careful not to put the poor people in one corner and the rich people <coughs> in another corner. We actually mix them up uh, so that the children of the poorer family can learn from the children of the richer family and they upgrade themselves, they get better educated. So there is no poverty ghetto. 
and also And the fourth point is we don't have ethnic enclaves because in Singapore, 75% of people are s Chinese, 15% Malays, and 7% Indians, and the other 3% from other parts of, a con of the world, other continents of the world. And in our allocation of the houses, we make sure that there's no high concentration of any ethnic group in one particular area. So basically, uh, to summarize, we have no homeless, no squatters, no ghettos, no enclaves. And we achieve this through public housing. And I think uh, I'm saying this not so much to boast about Singapore, is to say that uh, if we understand the problem and the need very, very carefully, then we should design our policies and design our methodology effect effectively. And such a thing, these things can happen. So this is the first point I want to say. And uh, the second point I want to talk about is uh, the, uh, the city planning of Singapore. While I spent 20 years in public housing, I also spent four years in upgrading the master plan of Singapore. So I can talk a little bit ab about that. Um, I would like to say that maybe the key thinking in the planning of Singapore could be summarized in three parts. The first part is to ident identify the factors for economic prosperity for creating sustainable and good environments, and for creating quality living. That's the first part. The second part is to calculate all the needs, the, the needs of all the spaces the city, all the citizens would require, the needs of all the spaces, and also calculate the amount of land that we need for development. So we do a lot of, we spent, we spent four years calculating all the needs between 1985 and 1989. And then after that, we know what must go into the city plan and then put all this, these pieces of land at, and roads and so on together to create an effective city. This is the second part. And the third part is that uh, we, must make sure that this city is not just something that works efficiently. We have to respect history. In fact, in Singapore, we have now permanently uh, been able to, we have been able to permanently s uh, keep over 7,000 uh, old houses. So we'll be there permanently. We also save our uh, rivers and hills and so on but we also respect the ter terrain. So I'd like to say that this very efficient city is embraced by history, by nature, work. by terrain, and also the uh, terrain and so on benefit from this efficient yeah. city. So in other words, I feel that to create a good city, what we did was uh, we basically created a, almost like a, a piece of industrial design because if you think of a car, the car must be user-friendly, okay? Uh, our city is simple to use, comfortable, convenient. The car's engine must work. So in our city, we assemble all the people's need together and make it work, very easy to use. And the car must be beautiful. So we try to create a city with history, nature, and beautiful uh, urban scape. So it's like a piece of industrial design. We need all these three elements to make a good city. So uh, why did we do this? I think you can imagine that in 1960, we were so poor, so desperate, and we were worried about survival. So the fear for not being able to survive and also the determination to build up our own self-respect drove Singapore drove Singapore to do what we did. And in the, in the process of doing that, what were the key considerations? Safety of the society, clean environment, 
sustain ecology, moving traffic, plus, of course, good education, uh, quality environment, prosperous economy, but above all, to have high esteem for our citizens. So I would like to say that, uh, uh, in short, uh, it, it seems to prove that uh, we can have quality environment at high density and create a garden city. And uh, because if we have good environment plus good government policy, it becomes, Singapore actually beca becomes, the, it's voted on a world scale, the best place to do business. And also, uh, on, the, on, the, on another survey, Singapore has very high density, but enjoy one of the highest livability index. And also, there was another survey showing that Singapore, Singaporeans are among the happiest people in Asia. So uh, since I'm in Saudi, I just want to say that uh, I was involved in the planning of King Abdullah Economic City. Uh, the master plan was completed five or six years ago. But I think I just want to add that uh, to make a city, to create a good city, on the one hand, we must have a good master plan. Uh, and if you compare that with cooking, a good master plan is like writing a recipe for a dish, but you still need a good chef to cook the dish in order to make it delicious. So I think although I've created the King of the Economic City, I think there's still a lot of work to be done to, to implement the plan. Thank you. Mr. Dr. Liu, thank you, uh, thank you very much. This was, uh, was very interesting. I guess you concentrated on, on two things. When one is housing, 93% owns and own a house. And then an amazing figure of 95% of your people is extremely satisfied, which is a very high figure. And secondly, you talked about design and urban planning. And I particularly liked the way you compared it with the manufacturing of a car. Just make it work. I think it's a simple but extremely complicated message. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you. Let's move to our second panel member, Joe Denko. Thank you, Ad. Um, and thank you, Your Royal Highnesses and Your Excellencies. Ladies and gentlemen, it's an honor to be here working with all of you to create the kingdom's competitive cities of the future. I want to emphasize three key points this morning. Embrace sustainable, innovative solutions. Accentuate what is unique about each city. Emphasize the quality of the public realm. As Odd indicated, Global urbanization will result in roughly 70% of the world's population living in urban areas by 2050. With more people living in cities and relying on the services they provide, cities are competing for natural resources and amenities to attract businesses and provide thriving communities for people who want to live and work there. Competitive cities are where people want to live because there are core jobs available and a vision for sustained growth. Historically, urbanization has propelled the growth of national economies. Almost 75% of global economic production takes place in cities. And urbanization, more importantly, can lift the majority of population above the poverty line. However, urbanization is accompanied by unprecedented consumption of natural resources. Cities occupy just 3% of the Earth's land surface and they house half of the human population, but consume 75% of the resources and account for two-thirds of all the energy and greenhouse gas emissions. We have limited resources on this planet. Therefore, development of new cities mandates a shift 
towards sustainable urbanization and innovative solutions. Competitive cities are more than just the sum of their parts. They are vibrant, accessible communities that attract business and provide an environment where people want to live and work. Competitive cities are focused on current and evolving needs to create an environment that enables long-term prosperity, social well-being, and the wise use of natural resources. I don't think it comes down to whether it's a new city or a regenerated city. We need to create resource-efficient new cities as well as revitalize our existing cities to be more competitive. We must accentuate what is unique about each city and intentionally build from their special assets. In other words, strengthen their strengths. This will enable them to attract investment and create long-term core jobs consistent with their special qualities. So how do we do this? Smart urban design that is grounded in local culture and diversity. Implement public, private, and other partnerships that foster an environment of creative yet practical innovation. Incorporate an inclusive housing strategy that ensures housing for all income levels. Design a mobility platform that intelligently combines mass transit, pedestrian, and auto to enhance commerce and meet the needs of those who live, work, and visit. Integrate nature into the urban environment under a practical, and I emphasize practical, framework of sustainability. Ensure accountability to your highnesses, your excellencies, and to the public through long-term continuous performance management. Engage the community through portals that share real-time information, such as how the city's performing on its targets for institutional, social, and financial metrics. If we follow these guidelines, we ensure that cities remain relevant to their people, connected and well-managed. Attracting investment and generating growth is not just about transportation, buildings, and other infrastructure. It's how we create the public experience, the street and squares, the places and parks. These will be the lasting legacy of cities. Integrating the historic and cultural fabric with creativity and innovation will create a sense of place in the public realm. This is what creates community that sense of belonging to something about my place. This is what attracts and retains the people and ultimately enables a competitive city to thrive. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. I think you touched on three points. Firstly, it was the public uh, realm which you, uh, which you mentioned. The quality of the public experience. Also, city must be relevant to people, holistic, communicated, and well managed. And lastly, and I, in fact, you started with that, the need for sustainable, innovative solutions. And later on, when we do the Q&As, we talk about new versus existing cities, but I heard you saying it doesn't make a difference. They both have the same challenges. And I see everybody nodding here. We will continue that discussion uh, later. Let's continue with David Smith. He is going to talk, I think, a little bit about the importance of the housing element in cities. I'm standing up because I'm easier to understand when I'm standing up. My name is David Smith. Your, excellent, your Royal Highnesses, Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, at the Affordable Housing Institute, we believe two things particularly relevant to this conference. One, cities are what make nations succeed. And two, housing is what makes cities succeed. 
in the 21st century, which is the century of cities, first time in human history that we've had a century of cities, national success depends on the comparative efficiency of cities. I didn't say that. My friend Rakesh Mohan, who's deputy governor, used to be deputy governor of the Reserve Bank of India, said that. And I'm going to say it again. In the 21st century, national success depends on the comparative advantage of cities. Now, why is that? Well, it's because in the 21st century, we have globalized value chains. We have a global economy, and that means that the things that make value, the things that make people richer, are spread all around the globe, the manufacturing processes. And we can do this because of technology. There are two great innovations, the shipping container and broadband. With shipping containers, you can move goods almost around the globe at tiny cost. And with broadband, you can move ideas around the globe, not only at tiny cost, but almost instantaneously. Everything happens at the same time in our world, and that wasn't true before. And that change is what's driving urbanization and driving the growth of our cities. Because cities are where strangers live companionably side by side. That's a difference between the city and the countryside, a difference between the city and the suburb. And for people to live in proximity with strangers, that means families live in proximity with strangers. And families care about four things. One, they care about safety. You can't move to a place and live in a place if you don't feel safe. Two, they care about what the spouse thinks. Because no matter what the executive thinks, what the spouse thinks determines where the family goes. Three, they care about their children because the children are the most valuable thing in the family. And four, because of those first three, they care about schools. Now, if you want to have those things, if you want to have safety, a happy spouse, happy children, and good schools, you cannot fence your way to those things. For 2,000 years, poor people have come to the city in search of a better life, and they have been right to do so. But rich people, at least in America, don't want to live with poor people. And so there's a natural reaction to put up fences. America tried putting up fences, and it didn't work. And in 1967, we had urban riots. South Africa tried putting up fences, and it didn't work. And in 1994, they had a revolution to make an inclusive society. So my message to you at this point is really very simple. Cities are what make nations work. Housing is what makes cities work. And inclusiveness is what it takes to make both of them work. Thank you very much. Thank you, David. So, housing makes a city a city. You start with that. I, I like that quite a lot. And you basically reiterated what I said. National success depends on a city. And last but not least, well, you said many things, but some of the key points. It's all also all about happy families, 
their children going to school, the importance of high quality social infrastructure, which is everything like schools, hospitals, etc. So, dear audience, before we start with our Q&A, been asked to remind you that you also can raise questions. You can use the Spot Me device. We will pick up on those questions and try to answer them as well. Let's try to make this as interactive as possible. So please do by all means raise your questions. So let's go into our Q&A. We, we oh, sorry, we already have a question there. That's, that's possible. Can you speak up a little bit? It's very difficult to hear Okay, you. my name is Sadiq Malki. I'm a university professor. I'll just uh, direct my question to the affordable housing. Uh, Mr. David, can you give us more of the elements of, uh, of affordability uh, that your institute came out with uh, that makes it so famous, uh, if you may? Thank you very much. Just before we do that, I mean, uh, David will answer that question, but there are a lot of sessions on affordable housing uh, later on, and I would like to stick a little bit to the cities, but take that, take that question, please, David, and then we move to cities again. I will make the answer simple. The private market starts at the top and works its way down. There comes a point below which you cannot achieve quality housing in the urban environment unless government is involved with provision of land, provision of infrastructure, provision of subsidy in its various forms. So as you move to cities, the role of government in the land development and the urban use development increases substantially. And my definition of affordable housing is housing which is of a good quality, as Dr. Abdullah talked about in his opening presentation, decent housing that is appropriate to individual households' needs. And it is the job of government, it is the job of the private sector to expand the amount of that supply that is available. Yeah, thank you. Okay, we, we talked about cities and we very much Okay, one more question. Okay, microphone. Yes, uh, my name is uh, Abdullah Abdeis Kamil. I'm in the real estate development uh, business. Um, and my question is to Dr. Liu uh, Kerr. Uh, he said that the, the right number of uh, people in a city was 200,000. Uh, my question is twofold. The first part is, do you mean 2,000 houses or do you mean 2,000 people? The second uh, question is, how did you reach to this number? And does it apply elsewhere in, in, the, uh, in the world or is it just uh, a number that's uh, relevant to Singapore? Thank you. Thank you for the good question. Uh, 200,000 people, not houses. And I, we arrived at this figure in uh, late 1960s, early seven, 1970s, by doing a lot of surveys. And what I did was to ask uh, clinics, uh, emporiums, department stores, and so on, to find out how many people do you need in a new town to support your facility. And the general consensus is around 200,000. So, but I don't think this has to be necessarily a universal figure. It has a lot to do with your, your ability to support the facility. Because, for example, in Singapore, as we have become richer now, uh, and also as our family sizes become smaller, it used to be 4.3, 4.4, now it's only 3.2, but with the same number of units. So the number of, the amount of people in each new town is now down to 160,000. But despite that, all the uh, 
clinics and so on, they still are doing very well. In other words, we can keep all the amenities and facilities inside the new town. Okay, thank you. All right, we, we talked about, about cities, we, we talked about urban planning and, uh, and design, we talked about quality of, uh, of, of life, but if we look at existing successful cities, isn't there more than that? I mean, I talked about attracting human, human and other capital. Let's talk about Singapore. I mean, Singapore is a great city, I've been there as well but you also see economically it's doing very well. In fact, Indian companies, if they do an IPO, nowadays they go to Singapore because their own stock market isn't very well regulated. And there are other examples of successful financial cities, cultural hubs, knowledge hubs. So what? It isn't that easy, I guess, than just have quality housing and, and public spaces. So What's more, what a city makes itself a unique, how does it attract that capital? Well, I, I started with Singapore, so maybe, yeah? Okay, so we first take, thank you. Thank you. Yes. Um, the question is related. Regarding your involvement with in uh, Jakarta Metro, can you speak up? Uh, did you find it challenging to factor in the cultural issues in the design of that city, and how did you manage that? What, what do you mean? How did you factor in the cultural element in the design of a city? The, uh, basically, uh, if you talk about culture in terms of lifestyle, uh, yes, uh, for example, uh, in our new towns, because as you know that the Malay population uh, have to have everything halal, and therefore we will, in our shopping centers, in our markets, and so on, we will put in uh, reserve server, several shops and several stores only for halal, just to make sure that the Ma Malay population in each new town can go to the nearby shops to, to buy what they want. And also in terms of uh, mosque, the government actually has a mosque development fund. That means the government comes up with a certain amount of money and the Malay population come with a certain amount of money. And we make sure that there's one mosque in every town, plus four to five uh, surau, the prayer rooms, so that the population can just walk to the near, nearby surau just to, to do their prayer. So this, and this is uh, extended across the same treatment will be given to the Chinese, to the Indians as well. So, uh, because uh, if we don't do that, it's not possible to attract people from different races to the same place. And by doing so, we create, actually, we want the different uh, ethnic groups to retain their culture, but also have the same uh, kind of Singaporean uh, value. So I hope that answers your question. Related to Singh Abdullah City design, design of the uh, economic city of Singh Abdullah here that you were involved in in designing. How, how did you factor in the, the cultural issue, the, the lifestyle, the, the preference of the people for their, for, 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 uh, their amenities and, and their housings and how did you factor that in? You're talking about King, uh, King Abdullah Economic City? Right. Yeah. Uh, King Ec uh, Abdullah Economic City, um, Obviously, um, well there, there are quite a few things that we had to consider, which we never had to consider in Singapore. For example, uh, near the uh, because King Abdullah Economic City is a city, 
of like 1.2 million to 1.5 million. It's quite big. Not a new town. New town is only about 200,000 people. So uh, at the near the central business area, we actually locate a very prominent site yes, for please. a mosque. And also we set aside a certain areas for palaces. Palaces as you, 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 you uh, as defined by, by Saudi. And also in the industrial areas, we have um, uh, workers accommodation in the industrial areas so that uh, people from all over Saudi, uh, workers when they come, they have proper place to stay. To stay. And of course, in the industrial area, the, the dormitory uh, development also has a sports field and uh, a shopping, small, very small shopping center. And, um, and also, we uh, built in a certain amount of, uh, well, the uh, hospitals and so on. And I was told also that uh, to to uh, respect your culture, we had to make sure that, uh, of course, uh, the schools must be segregated, boys and girls are separated, and they must be kept at a certain distance. So all these things have been told to us, and we put into the plan. Thank you. I, I guess, thank you for the question. Apologies, I did spot it at, uh, before, but I guess that answers part what I was trying to raise, what, what's more what makes a city successful, and the cultural element is an important thing of it. I've been told to close up quickly, but before I do, I've, I have one burning question to, to this panel, uh, which we haven't really touched, uh, touched on. And that's the question of new cities versus uh, existing cities. So what's better, create an entire new city with the possibility to build this great infrastructure, to build those public places, cultural, or is it about existing cities, regeneration issues, updating, upgrading infrastructure? And Joe, can I start with you? You said, to me, it doesn't make a difference whether it's an existing or a new city. Can you elaborate a little bit on that? And then I ask both David and Dr. Kerr to answer that question as well. Thanks. Uh, can you hear me? Um, we'll start with the existing cities. Uh, we've been involved in regenerating cities um, across the globe. In the UK, Sunderland, uh, the, uh, the Port of Sunderland, Scotswood Regeneration, Ebervale, also uh, in the United States, and, uh, and actually ABC uh, clean, clean Waters in Singapore. And um, existing cities have labor, uh, skilled labor. They have infrastructure. Um, they have already have a built environment um, to, to, to base from, and that's very important. Uh, they may have a good or bad reputation, though, or brand, so they need to adjust, and that can take a lot of time. Um, they need to benchmark against um, other cities that may have similar ingredients. They have to be innovative and creative, a willingness to take the next step. It may take many years to change a bad brand or a bad image. Um, and they, they also are not as cost effective. The total cost of operations in existing cities, antiquated transportation systems, uh, water, utilities, wastewater, um, energy systems that just aren't competitive because cities need to compete with each other. So these are some of the pluses and minuses of existing cities. But again, there's a lot there to build on and there's a lot of stories of success with regeneration. New cities can look at existing cities and they can harness the best technologies um, that are going on everywhere. There's technology labs um, across the globe and they can look at their new city in a holistic viewpoint, a systems view. How do we eliminate the term wastewater? Every bit of water has a beneficial use. Energy, um, minimizing energy, uh, energy use, the, the most optimal compact buildings. Um, so they can harness the best of technologies, but they need to do this. Again, I'll get back to accentuating the spe their place. Jeddah is a very special place. 
its culture, its history, its location, for example, is a tremendous asset. Every new city uh, or every city that wants to, uh, every place that wants to build a new city needs to look at its space and then weave in that technology to be able to uh, compete. I think as far as sectors, market sectors, it's important to focus um, on a balanced approach. You need to have sectors that are current and can enable competition, but build the infrastructure and have a regulatory, a municipal framework to be able to adjust because sectors change and change quickly, so there needs to be fluidity and the ability to adjust in the marketplace. But again, new cities have that, that stand-up advantage um, at starting fresh. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Kerr, I mean, you, you talked about Singapore, which is sort of a bit of a regeneration exercise, growing that city from 1.2 to 5 million uh, inhabitants. But you also developed King Abdul City. So you, you've been working on existing cities and, and new cities. So what's your answer to this question? What is your favorite? Well, I feel that in this world we have successful brand new city like Shenzhen and China, and we have also many successful existing city. Uh, I think there are pros and cons because existing cities, they have problems that they have to clean up, but they also give you a much better head start. They have population, they have some basic business infrastructure. Whereas for a new city, you don't have to clean up old problem, but you have to start, you have to attract population into the city. So I would say that at the end of the day, uh, whether one is successful or the other depends on government policy and good master plan. Government policies, good master plan. Thank you very much indeed. David, what's your answer to this question? Ex new cities or regeneration of existing cities? We have no choice. Existing cities are not going to disappear. Actually, there is a city in the world that's in the process of disappearing. It's called Detroit, Michigan. Um, for those of you who know, over the same period of time that Singapore was going from squatter settlement to its current, in 1960, the population of Detroit, Michigan was two million people. Today, the population of Detroit is 700,000 people. There are parts of Detroit where they cannot afford to keep the street lights on. There are parts of Detroit where if you call the police, they tell you they cannot come because they are understaffed. If your city shrinks, your city dies. If your city dies, its economy dies. Existing cities have their weaknesses. They have antiquated infrastructure, but they have history, they have global advantage, they have place. They are essential. You must regenerate existing cities. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. I guess that was touching on what I said at the, beginning, uh, at the beginning as well. Cities need to have growth ambition. And if you shrink, you die. And by the way, thank you for referring to Detroit. I come from Amsterdam. We have a huge office vacancy. And if you think it's worse, we always point to Detroit because I guess you have 30% over there. I think I've been told we are at the end of this session, but before doing so, I ask each of the panelists just a one sentence, what, are, what is the, the takeaway from this discussion? Also, taking into account the interest from the audience in other factors like cultural elements, etc. Dr. Kerr, what's your takeaway from this session? I think for a city to grow uh, successfully, government credibility the safety of society, good quality environment, and no surprises in the business rules and regulation, plus a good uh, pool of talents locally as well as foreign will help. Quite a big list. I like the no surprises reckoning as an economist. Joe? Yes, um, just to reemphasize some key points, I do think that uh, smart urban design it has to be local, grounded in the culture and the diversity of the location. Accentuate, again, what's unique about the location 
and the quality of the public space, create community, long lasting community for the people. And that will create and sustain a competitive city. Thank you, David. Urbanization isn't coming. Urbanization is here already. If you don't get in front of it, it will get in front of you. Cities that do not plan for their urbanization get unplanned urbanization, and the things that make them globally competitive get drowned in traffic, pollution, hygiene, crime, security problems. So the message is simple. Speed wins. Take risks, innovate, and be transparent and, and, and collaborative about it. Because the genius of cities is that it's thousands and thousands of people all making their best choices. Cities are smarter than any one of us. They evolve faster than any one of us. Harness that, you win the future. Thank you. So urbanization is uh, continuing, it can't be stopped. And that means to me it's, it, it's an opportunity and a threat. And then if you look at China, uh, they are very anxious to make sure that cities keep track with the growing pace of uh, urbanization. I think that, that brings us to the end of this session. Uh, later on, I moderate a session on sustainability. And to make the connection here, I guess what I most of all learned, competitive cities must be sustainable. And sustainable cities are almost, by definition, competitive. Please give a warm thank you to my panel members. Thank you so very much. كانت هذه الجلسة على أساس اقتصادي لشعب مدن تنافسية وجدد الشكر لسيد إد بويزمان رئيس العقارات في أوروبا والشرق الأوسط والهند وأفريقيا كارنست ويونغ وأيضا سيد جوزيف دانكو العضو المنتدب للبرامج الحضارية في سي إتش تو إم هيل الولايات المتحدة الأمريكية ودكتور ليو تاي كير مدير المخططين المعماريين والمهندسين بشركة آر إس بي في سنغافورة وأيضا شكرا لسيد ديفيد سميث مؤسس لمؤسسة الإسكان بأسعار معقولة في الولايات المتحدة الأمريكية